few people. I'll start again. Welcome, everyone. Um, I believe we're expecting around uh, 500 people for this lunchtime discussion. So we've had a tremendous response. Thank you so much for joining us and giving up your precious time, not least your lunch break in many cases. I'm Dr. Mary Hartog, and I'm the program leader for the DBA in healthcare leadership. And it gives me great pleasure today um, to begin uh, this first series in our uh, discussion, which is a prelude to the DBA programme, which will start in September, to have with me uh, Roger Klein and Joy Warmington, who are going to uh, give us uh, the insight on their about to be launched report um, on the failure of the health service to listen to and respond adequately to complaints and um, equality issues uh, of race from black and minority uh, ethnic staff. I just want to say a few things about how we're going to run the session. I um, will introduce the sort of premise of this um, work that Joy and Roger have brought uh, to us today. Joy will then take over, uh, followed by Roger. So Joy will talk about uh, the research and um, Roger will talk about the findings. We'll come back to Joy, who will be uh, talking about initial recommendations, i.e. what we can do. We will then open up the uh, webinar for you to ask questions. Um, and I'll be helped there by my colleague, Christiana, who has been busy letting everyone in. So um, a big thank you to Christiana for administering this event for us and um, getting us off to a great start. We want to just let you know, uh, is in terms of questions, if you can put questions into the Q&A, not into the chat, uh, we'll pick up from there. <clears throat> and um, before I kick off, I just want to say that our next webinar will take place on the 22nd of February. And our um, guest speaker there will be Professor Jill Mabon from Surrey University, talking about unprofessional behaviours in healthcare. So more about that uh, in due course. But um, to focus on today and um, what we are looking at today, Roger Klein is a research fellow uh, with Middlesex University. And his research has been around workforce culture. I've worked with and known Roger uh, for, for many years now, and I've always been intrigued by the interest that practitioners within the NHS and healthcare um, have had in his work, because it does seem to have very real practical application. And it's that insight, I think, that uh, we will see adds real value uh, to the work and this report that they are bringing to the table today. Joy Warmington is a visiting professor, and I've only got to know Joy quite recently, but I'm delighted to be working with her. She is the CEO of BRAP, which started in Birmingham over 25 years ago, now working um, working then around race action at a very local level, but has since then as an organisation um, impacted um, national governmental sort of insights around race and equality. But the, the work of that organisation, and Joy can say more, has been much more around um, social, community justice, organisational uh, equality and justice and um, staff leadership development, etc. So again, Joy comes with a wealth of practical experience and insight. The research that Joy and uh, Roger carried out was in part 
prompted by the um, tribunal case of Michelle Cox, um, which was taken up against NHS England. And um, as Roger will uh, you know, tell you, the findings of the tribunal really um, questioned what um, had been going on there and, and had a lot to say about what uh, the organisation had failed to do in its response. The research that Joy and Roger has carried out is essentially threefold. They looked at landmark tribunal cases where people had brought complaints and concerns of racism and discrimination. They looked at recent cases to see whether there was any correlation between the experience of complainants and findings of tribunals uh, existed. They undertook a literature review on the issue and they also carried out uh, a research, um, empirical research questionnaire uh, and survey to find out specifically about the lived experience of black and minoritized ethnic staff um, who brought concerns to understand A, what their experience was and B, what sort of response they got from the organisations. So it's on the basis of this very robust piece of work um, that they are here today. And I'd like to start by inviting Joy uh, to tell us really what's different about this report, uh, because I know we're hearing a lot today in the press about um, whistleblowing, people not being heard, uh, whether it's issues of race, other issues around um, care and so on in the NHS. What is it about this report that's different and why did you feel the need uh, to, to, to do this at this, this moment in time? Joy. Thanks, Mary. Um, I have to confess to be a little bit in trepidation with so many people on the webinar. So welcome to everyone. Um, I think that we could be we could be kidded in believing that this report is going to solve all of the problems. Um, it's going to, you know, um, address the issues that have been very long standing. And um, I suppose many people who read it will probably have a lot of I knew that already, a um, lot of aha moments in terms of what they get. I think it. It's it's interesting to us. I mean, we start the report by talking um, by by citing a quote actually from Tony Morrison. And Morrison who says the very um, she talks about the very serious function of racism is distraction, and it keeps you from doing this this work. And I think that the what I think is slightly different about this report is it talks critically about how in trying to address racism, you experience racism. So in an, in an, you know, in a setting where we should be thinking more critically about, well, what do we do to eradicate racism? How do we really begin to address those concerns? What black and minority ethnic staff have told us and the literature has told us and numerous reports have told us um, time and time again, is that when we're trying to address racism, racism faces us. So racism gets in our face. So that I think is what's illuminated by the report. And it goes into some details around why that is. It goes into some um, really specific um, recommendations about what organizations can do about it. And then the interplay in terms of um, the tribunal cases is quite interesting because, um, and Roger will say more about this, it, 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 what it shows is that the very things that 
um, tribunal cases have found in their um, in 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 really um, trying to say, well, listen, there's something NHS needs to do about this. These are the very same lessons and learnings that um, people who raise concerns about racism actually have raised within our report. So the correlation between the lessons from the tribunal cases and the issues and experience of staff is actually quite stark. So I think that's also quite a useful um, point to make in terms of this report. Thank you, Joy. That's really helpful to get that unique insight into what this report brings to the table. I was really struck by your comment about um, when you try to talk about racism, um, racism gets in your face. And it it's something I picked up uh, in reading your preliminary report. Uh, Roger, I want to bring you in at this point um, because I know you're going to talk about the findings. Can you explain that and 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 explain to to the audience? And I'm sure it will resonate with many in the audience. But for those who are still trying to understand what that means, um, and Joy, I, I was really conscious as well. You talked in the report about the whiteness of um, the system and how how we're frightened often to talk about race and racism. We seem to get ourselves in quite a muddle and we run away from it. What, what What's going on there, Roger? What, what did the findings tell you? So thank you, Mary, and um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's almost a year since Michelle Cox's claim of race discrimination and whistleblowing just sort of detriment against NHS Signum was unanimously upheld. Uh, and the tribunal decision, I think, was sort of symbolic and symptomatic of something deeply wrong in the NHS. Her courage in fighting her claim um, prompted our report. <clears throat> that was the, the initial spark for our report. Uh, and her court victory was followed by several others, by black and minoritised NHS staff. And it became obvious that the NHS had failed, failed completely to learn from the previous cases of race discrimination that it had lost. So the findings of these recent tribunals almost read really like a kind of a copy and paste of the failings of the earlier NHS tribunal uh, discrimination cases. Richard Hastings, mm -hmm. Elliot Brown, Mich uh, Eva Michalek are probably the most sort of well-known ones. And when we went through the cases, we identified these eight cases, we identified 21 themes that the courts had picked up. And I'm going to briefly go through some of them. A refusal to accept that race discrimination has taken place was common. <clears throat> Employers becoming defensive as soon as allegations of race discrimination were raised. Courts finding that most discrimination is not overt and therefore harder to prove. And yet employers insisted staff had to prove that those responsible were racially motivated for their case to be upheld, something the courts strongly disputed. Employers often insisting on looking at events individually, not the cumulative effect of a pattern of detriment, a complete failure to be curious. Uh, investigations were often poor and biased, racially biased. Uh, employers failed to be proactive and tended to wait for individuals to pluck up the courage to raise concerns rather than going to look for them. Management witnesses, I mean, this is a, a really kind of almost sad pattern. Management witnesses, including HR witnesses and investigators, were often seen as not credible. Uh, incompetence was common. It's unclear whether it, how much of it was deliberate and how much wasn't, but it was common in the handling of... Um, race cases. Um, retaliation for racial concerns was common, but employers did very little to anticipate it or to tackle it. And employers often were found to um, focus uh, too much on the distress caused by to those accused of racism rather than the impact upon those who were subjected to it. 
And when we when we analyze the findings of our of the 1300 responses to our staff survey, that confirmed that many of the tribunal findings are commonplace uh, in everyday life. So amongst the things that respondents told us, they said they were subjected to greater scrutiny than white colleagues in their work, were often held back in their career uh, development, uh, were regularly felt that they were undermined or marginalized and certainly experienced stereotypical assumptions about them. Large numbers had tried to raise the concern, most interestingly, um, particularly amongst higher graded staff. Those who didn't formally raise a concern believe nothing would change uh, if they did or that they will be seen as a troublemaker and they were worried about the repercussions. Those who did raise a concern frequently found that little or nothing happened to address their concern and they met a very defensive uh, response. Numbers of staff reported that they were subjected to retaliatory investigations or sanctions. Those who did raise a concern said the standard of evidence required allowed the perpetrator to escape censure. Numbers of staff said they felt that race discrimination was explained away, excused, distorted or overlooked. Um, HR were commonly felt to not understand how racism manifests itself at work and were unable to spot and respond appropriately when it occurred. And finally, something that I'm particularly kind of concerned about, only a quarter of those who were surveyed who were trade union members found trade unions very or fairly helpful, <clears throat> whereas over a third said they found them not helpful at all. So overall, the results of our survey showed substantial correlation with other research and the findings of the tribunal cases we consider. And you could summarize our findings saying as above all else, black and minoritized staff either do not raise concerns because they don't believe it will make any difference or might even make things worse. Or if they do raise concerns, they rarely find their concerns are taken seriously and acted upon. One of the cases we considered was that of Adelaide Kweyama, a nurse, a few weeks after Michelle Cox won her case, uh, another tribunal upheld Adelaide's claim against the London Trust, who defended a case in which she said she'd been told by a manager, and the tribunal accepted this had been said, after she complained of racial abuse from patients, the manager said she should, quote, go get a pool of bleach. I'm going to read this if you don't mind. Go get a pool of bleach and bleach your skin so that you come back tomorrow white and the patients will be nice to you. It was accepted this had been said, but the tr trust nevertheless defended the case and they lost. So to conclude, in such cases where investigations are, frankly, they're of a standard even the post office would be embarrassed about, with panels showing f too little sign of curiosity, um, what the trust did was defend a case that should have really prompted action on racism rather than preparing for a tribunal. So our careful analysis of such cases, our survey findings, our own understanding and from research about how racism works in the NHS has led us to our findings. And we hope we can signpost to the NHS some of the things it needs to do to radically improve the treatment of the one in four NHS staff who are from black and minoritized backgrounds. Uh, back to you, Mary. Gosh, uh, Roger, thank you for that very comprehensive overview of your findings. Um, and it really was quite shocking uh, to hear uh, what was said to that uh, nurse and um, the fact that it ever went to a tribunal that, that an organisation could um, think it was defensible, uh, defending the, the, the indefensible. Um, I often hear that listening and um, a lack of understanding of what constitutes racism and issues of equity and um, you know bullying and harassment is is not well understood. It's also, I think, very informative to hear you talk about um, both the trade unions and HR 
the um, inadequacy of management responses. And there's quite a few comments coming up in the chat about uh, HR. Um, can I then, given the time we have, ask Joy, um, what needs to be done and, and specifically, you know, what are your initial recommendations to organisations within the NHS about what they could and should be doing differently? And in particular, what lessons might we have for our colleagues in HR and, and organisation development and learning? Thanks. Um, thanks, Mary. Um, it's, it was just interesting, actually, hearing all those comments um, from the report again, Roger, um, you know, just speaking about it, how powerful it is, actually, when you when you hear some of those experiences. Um, in terms of the recommendations, one of the strongest recommendations we have is perhaps one of the, the things that the NHS struggles with the most, really, which is to do with its with its culture, a culture of openness, encouraging people to be able to talk more freely about race. And the fear of not being able to talk about race is part of the it's a it's a bit of a trap that holds the system almost in a state of frozenness. So because I can't talk about it, because I don't understand it well enough, I try to minimize it, I try to dismiss it, I don't understand it, um, I put it in the too hard to do box, I try um, and... Um, uh, you know tell the person that they can you know they need to go and sort it out themselves or it's just a bit of a misunderstanding with their manager so the whole issue of being really competent about talking about race it's like a foundational plank to all of this stuff I mean I I often say to people I mean we work with about seven thousand eight thousand people a year 60 to 70 organizations and I, of, I often say to people we're in 2020 well, I was in 23 when I last said it, and we're still struggling with, um, with, with being able to have conversations about this idea around race when our organisations and our, and our society is becoming so much more diverse and is diverse in lots and lots of cases. So I think that's one of the, the first constructs around our recommendations. And we also... We also kind of say that that's not a toolkit thing that, you know, sometimes people produce a toolkit on this and actually you need more than a toolkit. You need to have a, a very uh, a practice within your organization from board to right to the front line where um, people uh, feel that they can speak openly about these issues. The other thing that we thought um, critically about was setting standards of behaviors. Many organizations within the NHS have values, but we don't necessarily loop those values in to being able to understand and capture and sanction everyday racial um, behaviors. So that the kind of racism that black and minoritized staff experience on an everyday basis, it needn't be there if we were better at supporting staff to understand what they're doing and how they can actually stop what they're doing and sanctioning them if they don't. So there's something very open about we want to create a better organisation, but we're not prepared to take any accountability for that. We talk about things like creating a coherent anti-racist strategy. And what we often say about that is organisations like to say, that they're anti-racist when they don't really understand what that's about. And we explain in the report the relationship that we have to systemic issues of racism. So the fact that an organization really makes race doesn't really recognize how it does it. But if you can, if you imagine a little hamster on a treadmill, actually what anti-racism is trying to do is it's trying to intervene in that. It's trying to say, how do we stop it? And many of the practices that we adopt in terms of our interventions, we talk about the, that the fact that this is actually, they're transactional in nature. They are linked to an October Black History Month or um, 
you know, doing things with the employee networks. And I'm not saying, and we're not saying that those things aren't important things to do, but they don't address the root causes of racism. And that's really what one of the, the biggest recommendations in the report is actually in, 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 in conjunction to the, the other bits about the tribunal cases. That if we don't address the root causes of racism, we're on this merry-go-round where nothing seems to happen and um, we only change things incrementally. We also talk about addressing or taking notice of the early warning signs. So in many of the cases that we um, we analysed, and I'm sure Roger will agree, it could have been addressed much earlier if people had felt they had the skills to address it and if people had noticed it. And um, I think that those two combinations of things that we say strongly need to be worked on. But if you see your your data going in a, in a, 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 di a different way from where it should be going, if you get more informal complaints, what organisations do is they tend to sit on it and wait for it to be escalated. And we're saying, actually, these are, these are things you should be able to notice and intervene. And that really means um, some very strong recommendations that we've made around uh, the opportunities to develop the competence of particular staff members, HR staff, trade unions. I mean, we've had a course with the HPMA, specifically, Roger has been part of this, trying to support HR and business management um, business professionals in this area because if they don't understand what's going on if they don't have the confidence to intervene early then when you go to HR everything just you know things things get dismissed um, so uh, and there's quite a few detailed recommendations around case law um, not penalizing people for complaining duty of care um, actually one of the challenges we've had is trying to as condense the recommendations because they kind of they kind of go on a little bit further than we'd want to but you know there's some there's some stuff in there that I think you know totally support Roger's point if people were to just take a few of those things and do those well it would really get people right back onto a page where they're addressing the root causes I think if I may uh, so if I may Mary add to so I completely agree with what Joy has said one of the big you better, Roger. It's in our report. You know that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get told off. Um, what tends to happen is organisations wait for individuals to raise concerns. But as we've shown, um, the consequences of doing so are such that people are very hesitant about raising concerns because they've seen what happens to other people when they do. So we have to, as we would with many other issues, we have to be proactive preventative in precisely the way that Joy has talked about, because relying on individuals to raise concerns, giving ourselves mm -hmm. sort of false assurance, really, that we've got policies, procedures and training that will make it safe and effective to do so, just doesn't work on race. It doesn't work for precisely the reasons Joy summarised. Thank you, Roger. I've been... Um, watching the chat as you spoke, Joy, and so many comments um, endorsing what you've said, and you talk a lot about lived experience in the report and how it's important that, that we understand the lived experience of black and minoritised ethnic uh, staff. Um, and and that difference between, you know, a sort of a conscious awareness of what is blatant racism and, and what is is unconscious. Um, and, and I guess I was struck by that very real lack of understanding that you highlight in your report. Um, but perhaps like some of my fellow HR professionals, and although I don't, you know, practice as an HR professional now, I taught HR for over uh, 25 years. And I can see in some of the chat here, you know, how saddened HR professionals are in the audience uh, to hear about this lack of understanding 
and real lack of com you know competence and i was wondering myself you know what is it and is there something we as educators need to address in our training of hr professionals as well that's missing um and certainly in terms of the learning and development response uh, as you rightly point out that need to get beyond the toolkits a number of people have said absolutely joy uh, yes we need to go beyond the toolkits and systemically examine what the root causes are um, and really to look at transformational development rather than these transa transactional, um, as it were, interventions, whether it be, oh, yes, look, you know, we're great, we're doing Black History Month again, and oh, yes, we've got a race champion, et cetera, et cetera, with very little really behind that that informs practice. And I have to say, I think what really struck for me uh, was, was your phrasing of practice from board to the front line, that we need a practice of anti-racism that is uh, developed in our organisations and an awareness of what uh, that really means in practice that I hadn't um, heard before. And that link between setting standards of behaviour and linking it to values. And I see um, with organisations, NHS trusts that I'm currently working with, a lot of emphasis on values, our organisation values about respect and care and listening. And many of those have been informed as well by lessons learned from the pandemic that we need to support our staff more but actually uh, taking that a step further. So, you know, really listening and taking a step back rather than being defensive and reactive, as you said, Roger, being proactive. Um, all of these uh, themes that you've developed and recommendations that you've developed certainly make perfect sense. Um, and that level of defensiveness, why, you know, why are we not doing this? Why is it that we're perhaps no for further forward than we were 20 odd years ago, when now one in four members of staff in the NHS uh, come from black and ethnic minority uh, groups? I am just watching the time now, and I, I want to thank you both and give you an opportunity now to, as it were, meet with the audience and answer some of their questions. So would that be okay if we, we move to questions from the audience? I, I can see certainly lots of, there's over 99 comments in the chat and already we've got 26 in the Q&A. So Christiana, if you're able to join us again so we can together administer uh, the questions, that would be really great. What are, you, what are you noticing in the Q&A, uh, Christiana? Um, we have a lot of questions around HR, which we will absolutely get to. But due to the upvoting, I think we will begin at the top with Safia. So Safia asks, what, what is about you? Oh, actually, sorry. Um, that's, sorry, that's actually speak with Roger. Roger, can um, we allow access to the report, first of all? I think a lot of people are hoping to um, see your report with Joy. Is that is that something that you can share or is it something that they need access to via? We're, we're going to be formally launching it on Tuesday. So this oh, amazing. Is, think of this as a kind of Hollywood trailer. Um, <laughs> so we're going to be launching it online on Tuesday, I think about lunchtime. Joy and will be uh, it'll be all over Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and so on. Um, and my guess is that we hope that there will be lots of conversations. Um, we've already had invitations to speak to groups of HR directors, for example, and to trusts. So I'm hoping that there you know that there'll be lots of conversation about this, but leading to people doing things. Um, I, I think Joy and I have got, got to a stage where. You know, stuff needs to happen, uh, not just for us to produce a report. So next next Tuesday lunchtime is when the report will go live and we'll be um, announcing that on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and so on. We'll also, I think, be emailing everybody if we're allowed to, I think, uh, with the link. 
Thank you, Roger. So quite a few questions there. Um, a really interesting one coming from Elizabeth here, um, asking how could a trust defend such a case? And I think this may be about uh, the nurse who was, you know, told to bleach her skin and come back. People will like you uh, better if you do that. How how can a trust defend using public funds? To so, defend such a case. This was a really interesting example where this was an agency nurse, and the trust got itself into a real mess about what its responsibility was when an agency nurse uh, was complaining of race discrimination. Uh, and uh, they just made a complete so this was, became a procedural reason to not address the issue. And if you go back, several years to the case of Richard Hastings at King's College Hospital, which cost the NHS a million pounds and wrecked his career in the NHS. It was exactly the same thing. Richard Hastings was abused by some contractors in a van and the trust got itself into a real mess about what exactly was its responsibility for contractors who were um, being abusive. They also made it a complete mess by making, by, by kind of, pointing the finger at the person who'd been subjected to racism. But it's very common for organisations to try to find procedural reasons not to address substantive issues. It happens within organisations. It happens within the tribunal system. It's, I'm commonly told that organisations look as if they've delayed dealing with issues, so it's too late for people, for example, to lodge tribunal cases. So I don't think the trust will actually defend what this person said but what they wouldn't do was to say right the real issue here is racism let's deal with that what on earth are we doing spending public money on a tribunal and i think when i've spoken to groups of hr directors i say can you put your hands up if you're confident you don't have a case like michelle cox's inside your organization and so far not a single person has put their hand up to say no we're sure we haven't so this is a very common or potentially very common problem. What we've described are not isolated examples. Deal with the issue. Don't get drawn into all the procedural stuff where you don't have to confront the issue for the sorts of reasons that Joy has said. Thank you. That's really interesting, Roger. I want to um, invite Andrea here. Uh, she's got a question about board members. She says, do you think board members setting personal EDI objectives can make a difference? And if so, what makes for an impactful objective that would tackle the root cause of racism? Joy. I'm going to be really sceptical into this and I'm going to say no. It really does depend on the type of objective. Um, we have done a piece of work. Um, if anybody wants it, they can email me on it. That um, looks more critically at how you would set more impactful EDI objectives. If you set objectives which are, uh, you know, we're going to sponsor a network, um, we're going to listen to staff, um, not that listening, I'm not being dismissing of dismissing of listening, but we've actually listened a lot. And I think the action is not forthcoming with the listening. So there's very little in this report. And when you get it, you'll read it. And as I said initially, there's very little in there that you will not say, um, I didn't know this was going on. If you if you read it, many people would be uh, would be concurring with the findings of this. Absolutely. So there's something about what the action is. And it is a really good question. What is the role of board members? What is the role of, of the executive team of, of leaders? And I think we say in the report, you've got to lead by example. You've got to be able to talk about the, you know race and racism. You've got to be able to see discussions in the in the board meeting. You've got to recognise that race isn't just about discussing um, when somebody, um, a person of colour or a person from minorities group, comes in. You've actually got to be talking 
about it all the time because it's systemic. So, and your ability to recognize it in the system and recognize it in yourself and how racism is held by us all is really kind of critically important. And that's the bit I think people don't get. When we talk about racism, all heads turn to people that look like me. And actually, we need to be turning our heads to all of us, actually, especially people who, who are white or white presenting, because unless we can all do some heavy lifting around this, how do we how do we change it? You know, so um, I think there's a there is a challenge in terms of those objectives. If they can feel very tick boxy, they can't. They don't often feel sharp. They don't feel invasive enough. But if you have an objective and you don't understand the agenda, it's it's kind of just putting icing on a on a very poorly baked cake. You know, you need to understand more about what you're doing and what it really means to deliver against this agenda. Just to add to that, Mary, when when leaders get the agenda, they are much more likely to seize on the opportunities to demonstrate to staff that the organisation really cares about this issue. And uh, some, some of those listening may have heard the example I've used in the past. If somebody walks into uh, an A&E department and says, I want to be treated by a white nurse or a white doctor. It's an, actually an opportunity for the trust leadership to demonstrate that's not going to happen here and make it really clear both to black and minoritized staff and to white staff. This is where this organization stands because you have to convince people that you're serious about it. If you're not, why will people feel confident about raising concerns? They will, they will just carry on or they'll vote with their feet, and disengage. So the you know when things are a challenge, they're also an opportunity. Thank you, and Joy, I was really struck by you know the heavy lifting is a responsibility of us all, and I was really struck in the report by a comment about how often um, you know a, a black. Um, colleague would get invited on to a board to give the black or minority perspective um as if you know well that does the job that 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 ticks the box uh, and that that's enough um thank you there's something here um coming it's an anonymous attendee about speak up guardians um and non-exec board members um what's their remit in all of all of this um roger because i i noticed in your preliminary report some some comments about how effective or otherwise speak up guardians have been and that that doesn't you know on on the surface it sounds like a great idea to help people get their concerns across um, and there is some notion of protection there in terms of the potential uh, for a whistleblower to be supported and not um, experience, as it were, retribution. What's the role of, of um, Speak Up Guardians and, and what is their remit and how effective are they? Well, what would you say? Speak Up Guardians were set up following the Francis Report 2015. One of the findings of the Francis report was that black and minoritized staff who raised concerns were less likely to be listened to, more likely to be um, victimized uh, and uh, less likely, therefore, to raise concerns again. So one of the remits of freedom to speak up guardians should be bullying, racism and so on. The problem is a, a, speak, a freedom to speak up guardian is only as good as the organisation they work in. So you have this bizarre situation where the most effective freedom to speak up guardians are in organisations who really want them to work. And in the places where they're really needed, they actually tend to be uh, very challenged, very difficult to do the job and often um, becomes a bit of a tick box. And the recent report from the National Guardian on freedom to speak up uh, guardians very tellingly 
this was a review of staff survey data for 2022, the most recent report a couple of months ago. The title of the report about the work of speaking up in the NHS was uh, Fear and Futility, precisely the finding that we have found in terms of race. So some freedoms of speak up guardians are fantastic. They do a brilliant job. They do raise issues of racism and bullying and so on. But I think many find it very difficult and it's much harder to do it in organisations where the organisation doesn't want to listen and act. And ironically, those are the places where they're most needed. So I think we need a, a fairly, fairly thorough review of whether or not the freedom to speak up guardian approach, certainly in isolation, is likely to be the one that's going to address this issue. That's really interesting because there are a few concerns and comments about experience, um, you know, not being that great of um, approaching a speak up guardian in in the Q and A. Some are great, but 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 general generally, I don't think they're nearly as effective as they should be. Interesting. And and you raise that spectre of the organisation culture yet again. If the culture itself is not open and conducive to listening and is defensive, then that's more likely uh, to make the work of those speak up guardians less effective. And I noticed here in the Q&A, someone asked, is it the case that HR practitioners too are themselves, if you like, influenced by the culture of their organisations? Are they almost, um, you know, mirroring the, the lack of uh, competence in the organisation and the lack of um, feeling the fear as well that they don't want to be uh, seen to be challenging the status quo? Um, I just wondered if you had any so thoughts about that. So I, I peer reviewed a piece of work that was, oh, Joy's disappeared. Oh, uh, I peer reviewed a piece of work done for um, by the HPMA in London amongst HR business partners. Uh, and <clears throat> what came out of that was some serious concerns, particularly from black and minoritized uh, HR colleagues about the way that they themselves were treated within their own profession. So it's not surprising that HR are also affected by cultures within organizations. In some organizations, there's a real effort for HR to be proactive uh, on these sorts of issues. But it's not surprising that in general, they are impacted by the, the overall culture within the organization. Thank you. There's quite a few um, questions here to do with um, the nursing profession and their professional bodies um, and a question about what, you know, what can we do to um, engage them and to perhaps educate them? There's a comment here about often, um, you know, staff themselves don't have, have enough knowledge uh, so, about racism. But what about the professional bodies? Well, two things. First of all, the regulator, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, in my view, uh, has quite a lot to learn about how it addresses issues of race. Um, there's been a series of cases where panels have clearly reached wrong decisions. Um, and so I don't think they're nearly, uh, they've tended to be a bit behind the curve on the issue. In terms of professional bodies, I think both the... Uh, RCN and the RCM have formal policies, which are very good. But I think in practice, on the ground, the experience of staff is pretty patchy, that there are some very good officials. But I consistently hear stories where officials have not done um, what they should have done, in my view, as a former trade union official. So one of the things, one of the learning points from this um, research is that there are things for trade unions to improve on so that all officials work in the way that the best ones do. Because at the moment, it's quite clear from our surveys that that's not the case. Thank you. I should say one last thing, that, that when you look at the leadership of the NHS, um, you know, the, the, the chief nurse has been rather better uh, on this issue 
than some other people. I'll say no more than that at the moment. Thank you. And indeed, we might hear more about that when um, we're joined by Professor Jill Mabin um, for our next session on the 22nd of February. Um, I'm going to pick up a couple more questions before we start to, to, to bring this to a close. There's one here. Um, it might be for you, Joy. I'm glad to see you're back with us. If the NHS did nothing at all, what would be the one action you would recommend they take to make some impact? Oh, that's a hard question. I'm oh, sorry, no. I, I had a I had a little bit of a, a challenge there, so I had to dip out. Um, I think that some of the organisations that we're now working with that are really um, I think in the on the right journey in terms of the taking the, the right trajectory towards these issues what they are really doing is understanding and taking responsibility for racism so they're not seeing it as being um, a set of tick boxes they're actually seeing um, how they in their organization in their lives in their mind in their interactions with people how they maintain the status quo which allows racism to continue. So I think the biggest thing I would say is how do people understand it? Because as long as you don't have a good embedded understanding of it, can't do anything about it. Thank you. That's that's really sort of fundamental, isn't it, to um, our role as, as human beings in the world, that, that we have an obligation to, to understand. Um, there's another question here about, um, if you like, the politics of this. Are you are you going to do anything by way of lobbying ministers um, or politicians um, following the publication of your your report about what we could do? I don't know what Roger Roger might want to say. I think one of the things that we don't often recognise is how political race is, how politicised it is. So what we do about it and what we don't do about it is often dictated by the politics of our society. So it is a really important point. Um, you know, I would love to be able to sit down and have a conversation with, with anybody about, about the work that um, this report illuminates and what might be better things to do. And I think like many people in the chat, it, it would, I'm fed up of history repeating itself. Um, I mean, one of the things that we say to people when we work with them, it's possible to end this, you know. This could be something that when you, when it, yes, it, it's always going to happen, but the substantive horrible things that happen in your organisations actually could be things that we can begin to mitigate against, we could reduce, we could lessen. This does not have to be something that we suffer from. And I think I'd like more people to believe that. And, you know, there's something about our belief that racism is inevitable. And for me, I, I you know, being a grandmother now, I just don't want to believe that. I want to believe that there's something that we can do about this. This is a manufactured process of discrimination based on lots of um, really poorly um, created belief systems. So I, I'd, lo I'd love people to be able to recognise that and for it to be less politicised and more of a, a, a issue to do with how our society becomes healthier, how we become more connected to each other and how we can live better with one another because I think this, is, this just seems to be so needed at the moment. Roger, you might have something less political to say or more political to say <laughs> well i think what i would say is it's a great pity um that the current regime has got itself uh in into a kind of uh set of tram lines where it's obsessed with political correctness and edi has become part of that political correctness so many of those um watching this will know of the letter from Steve Barclay to the NHS saying, why are we spending all this money on EDI? Um, which I think got a fairly good pushback, actually, from the system. 
but that's part of a wider problem. And I think other parties, particularly the Labour Party, need to be fairly direct in taking those issues on. And I'm sure Joe and I, we, I'm, I'd be very happy to go and speak with the um, Secretary of State for Health. I'm sure Joy would um, be very happy to and be very happy to talk to the Labour Party and the Liberal Party, the Liberal Democrats and so on about these issues. But at the heart of them, this is about, you know, it is it would be brilliant for the health service and for health care if if we got a grip of this kind of cancer within um, employment relations within the NHS. So that's why it's important. It's a real pity politicians tend to talk in very general terms, either, oh, this is political correctness, or they don't look at the nuts and bolts of what precisely needs to be done. It becomes very performative, it becomes very processy, rather than actually what needs to be done that the evidence suggests is likely to work. Thank you. Um, we're almost there in terms of time. We're, we're, we're on the hour at uh, one o'clock. Um, Lots of comments in the chat coming up saying, thank you, Joy, thank you, Roger, for a very thoughtful, thought-provoking uh, session. And could the next webinar perhaps be a little bit indeed for joining us today and um, providing us with your stimulating questions and feedback. Uh, we will be in touch. Um, and tweet uh, the details of our next session with Professor Jill Mabon on unprofessional behaviours in healthcare on the 22nd of February. And in the meantime, those of you who are interested in the DBA in healthcare leadership, please do get in touch. Um, you can email me and my details have been provided uh, on the link um, and those who might be interested in an MBA um, you can email my colleague uh, Jyoti Navar. We are in the process of sorting out um, our web page for the DBA Healthcare Leadership but in the meantime you can um, make an application via the generic uh, DBA button which will lead you to the DBA Healthcare listing and we look forward to uh, receiving applications from the many of you um, that have been in touch and have responded to the flyer but if you would like any more information please don't get uh, hesitate to get in touch with myself um, or you know or Roger and, and Joy we'd be happy to follow up uh, with a one-to-one -one, um, and also to run some collective briefing sessions uh, going forward. Thank you very much again, uh, Roger, Joy, and thank you all for giving up your, your lunch time. Um, we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd of February. Thank you.